plan to talk about Lumen. It's a project I've been working on for about the last, or a bulk of the last year, I guess. Um, thanks to investment by my employer, Dockyard, uh, who has, in general, been trying to invest in R&D uh, in the Elixir and Erlang community in general. So uh, working for us is Chris McCord, who uh, runs the Phoenix Project. Uh, I was originally hired to work on Distillery, which is like a OTP releases uh, project uh, for Elixir specifically, sort of like the Relics project for Erlang. Um, Lumen is really sort of the next step for me in terms of where I've been focusing my efforts in the past year and is really looking towards the future of where uh, Elixir and Erlang are going to be used next or where we think they'll, it'll be used next. So what is Lumen really? It's a new compiler and runtime for Elixir and Erlang. Um, it's really built around Erlang, but because Elixir compiles down to Beam bytecode or uses Erlang internally essentially to do that, uh, we can support other Beam languages as well. The goal is to bring Beam languages to WebAssembly, so to be able to use them in the browser with all of the functionality of the Beam. So this is not like a new syntax for the web, which we're not particularly interested in. It's an interest in bringing Beam and the OTP standard library to the web as well, at least the parts of it that are worth bringing to the web. And so this is really a path for building things uh, that the Beam is not necessarily well suited to support. So building web applications is just basically a non-starter to begin with with the Beam. It's not an environment that it was ever built to uh, run in. Not necessarily intentionally, it's just sort of a side effect of its implementation. Um, it is possible to build UI applications in the Beam, but as far as delivering tools uh, and applications to environments you don't control, so imagine like building a command line tool that you want to distribute and just like drop on a machine somewhere. This is a non-trivial problem to solve with the way the Beam is built. Uh, use OTP releases to package up a bundle that contain your application and everything. Um, but cross-compilation is basically a non-trivial story. And pretty much any time you're targeting a new like kernel version, for example, or a different uh, libc, that can cause things to break. So there's some issues around that. Typically, you want to control the server environment you're running Erlang applications in fairly tightly so that you know exactly uh, how you're producing the build artifact for those machines. So why are we building like a new compiler and runtime for Erlang uh, specifically? A lot of our work is web applications, rich web applications. So these are like single page apps and such. Um, we do a lot of back end work as well, but this is definitely a major piece of our client work that we do. Um, and because of that, we constantly have an eye towards uh, what's changing, what's coming down the pipe in terms of technology and things that we want to use. One of the major problems is that the client-side ecosystem is super fractured and constantly in flux. Uh, and part of that's due to you know, how Spartan JavaScript was at the beginning. A lot of things are being sort of reinvented from the ground up, not because they need to be necessarily, but Oftentimes, because new patterns are being brought into JavaScript, the language itself is uh, evolving, the browser and DOM APIs are evolving. And so because of that, uh, you kind of have this really shaky ground that you're building on all the time. One of the things that Brian, uh, CEO of Dockyard, um, and really sort of the progenitor of you know, the idea behind this project, wanting to target WebAssembly, he sees WebAssembly as really a way to solve that by allowing us to bring the tools and libraries that we use all the time to the web and be able to target uh, the web application using the same like unified set, basically. Less of this constantly changing influx kind of situation. And the only thing that's really changing are the browser APIs uh, that you care to use for building your web applications. And again, if you're already using like Elixir and Erlang on the back end, uh, 
and you're using JavaScript on the front end, the only reason you're really using JavaScript on the front end is because that is the de facto language of the web. But with WebAssembly, that changes. And the question really remains, like, why would you necessarily want to use two languages if one language can be used to uh, be used in both environments uh, without any loss in capability or features? Excuse me, I'm a little thirsty. Anxiety sucks. Anyways, so better question is why why Erlang and Elixir specifically? Like, why are these languages even useful for the web at all? And one of the reasons for Dockyard specifically is the idea of cross pollination, right? So we have sort of a split between our front end and our back end teams. Uh, back end is mostly Elixir and Erlang. Um, and then front end is like Ember, and we've been transitioning to React and mostly exploring different front end technologies, but that's kind of this clear divide, right? But we have people that are on the front end that want to learn Elixir and Erlang and work on the back end and vice versa. And there's really no reason for us to have this divide if it's not necessary. And if we can use one language on the back end and the front end, then both these teams can essentially meld together and we have better cross pollination of knowledge and experience. Um, we're able to take the tools that we build for one side or the other and potentially share them to, you know, if we're building stuff for the back end that's not like server side specific, it can be reused on the front end if we're using one language for both. And in general, Erlang OTP provides a lot of really nice tools. Uh, you know, ETS is a great example. Erlang Term Storage is like this miniature database, right? Key value storage that you have uh, right there. And it's key to a lot of different uh, like Erlang patterns that are common. You have Observer that's really powerful for introspecting applications, seeing uh, where your performance holes lie, um, being able to figure out like why you know is part of my application running really slow or you're consuming a lot of memory. It gives you all those tools to poke and prod at your application. Um, and that's pretty unique across different platforms. Most of the time, if you find that kind of thing in another language, it's some tool that somebody else built. It's not part of the standard tooling of the language. And there's a variety of libraries and useful tools in the ecosystem in general that are really desirable to be able to use, at least in my opinion. So if we're able to take advantage of those, that's a really powerful thing. In general, I personally, and I know Brian agrees with me, find that actors are a really nice fit for component-based user interfaces, right? Uh, you have these very tightly focused state machines essentially that control just one part of an overall application and failure and all of those conditions are handled in one place. And then you have all these built back up into sort of a tree that meshes really well with the way a uh, like React based application is structured for example. And with the addition of like supervisor trees and concurrency we're able to essentially have a UI that can be doing multiple things at the same time where part of it can maybe crash or fail temporarily but not affect the rest of the application. Um, and it, it's able to self-heal, like recover from those failures, right? So if you're on a mobile device and you cross from like one internet connection to another and you temporarily lose internet while you're messing around in a web application, something that's based theoretically in Erlang Elixir front end would be able to handle that gracefully, where in a traditional JavaScript application, unless that case was specifically dealt with, it's unlikely that that would be the case. Typically, when a JavaScript application crashes, it crashes for good unless you reload the page. So there's a couple things that are useful to know about WebAssembly before I kind of get in a little bit to the way Lumen is built. Um, what is it specifically? It's an instruction set and then a binary and textual format for representing the bytecode, essentially. Uh, you can think of it like assembly, but it's slightly higher level than that, but it's still quite low level. You're manipulating instructions um, the same way you would with a traditional assembly like x86-64. Uh, it's designed for a stack-based virtual machine as opposed to like a register machine which is what you're more likely to be familiar with if you're familiar with assembly and other environments. However, it's really designed to be portable, um, embeddable in other environments. 
I know uh, there's a talk following me here shortly, I think, from the Fastly CTO about how they've actually embedded that uh, on the edge. And it, in general, you know, the browser environment is just one case of embedding that as well. Uh, you know, in theory, you could embed it in like a game and run a scripting engine for doing like scripting events and stuff like that. Uh, using WebAssembly is sort of like the fundamental VM for that. It's memory safe, um, and I mean really memory safe. It's impossible to manipulate the memory of the outer, like the host itself, unless you expose host APIs to the WebAssembly environment intentionally, uh, which is almost always going to be very carefully done if you care about sandboxing. And sandbox by default. So that means that if you just take a WebAssembly runtime, uh, load a WebAssembly module into it, it's not going to have any outer access whatsoever, which means it can't really do much. But the idea is that you add in functionality that you specifically want to expose to the WebAssembly environment. In the browser, those are the browser and uh, JavaScript APIs, right? The key to that sandboxing memory safety uh, property is the fact that it's a Harvard architecture. That means that the code and the data, uh, like address spaces, are separate. It means it's not possible to like take the address of a function and jump to it. Um, they're entirely separate. You can't take the address of a function or any code whatsoever. Uh, in order to call a function, you essentially take the index. It's like a big jump table. You say, I want to call the function at index 0 with these arguments. And it will fail if that function doesn't exist in the function table. So it's safe in that sense. Uh, keeps data very pure in the sense that you can't load something into memory that is executable and would allow somebody to hijack a, a session and take it away from the user. One of the kind of more annoying aspects of this is that the only way currently, in the browser anyways, uh, to pass data back and forth between a WebAssembly module and a native module, like a JavaScript uh, application, is using integer values. It's very annoying because that seems like it would basically constrain you to be able to do hardly anything useful at all. But there's actually a number of ways that you can work around this. For example, from the host on a JavaScript side, you can access the linear memory of the WebAssembly module. Oops. And uh, so the integers that you pass back out can be an address to, in the memory and the size of that memory. And now you have a buffer of memory that you can work with. Uh, so this is how you'd pass like strings in and out of the WebAssembly environment. So specifically targeting WebAssembly with Lumen, and that means you know, how do we compile Erlang and Elixir to this environment? There are three major constraints. That's code size, the load time, and the concurrency model that the WebAssembly engines in the browser use, and really WebAssembly in general right now. Um, code size is an obvious constraint because the more code you have to download onto the, the client means the longer it takes to load the application, period, and the longer it takes to compile that code into something executable by the host. Um, that directly affects the second property, which is load time. The longer it takes to load your application, the slower it appears to users. The more annoyed they get, the more likely they are to just go somewhere else. Um, and then the concurrency model is very unique in WebAssembly versus a traditional like server environment. There is no threads that you would be familiar with. Um, it's more like you're given processes. Um, the specific set of APIs that are exposed are called web workers. And they're essentially diff multiple independent processes in an operating system versus multiple threads within a process. What that means is you can't trivially share um, objects between different workers. There are some efforts to work around this, but the threading model uh, and WebAssembly is still evolving. And then specifically with regards to JavaScript and the DOM, we have three major things. One is just how do we call functions in JavaScript, period. Uh, dealing with async functions in particular, uh, one of the things that that changes is in the scheduler, 
of Lumen, which is very much like the Beam scheduler, we have to represent JavaScript async functions separately than we do closures within Erlang and Elixir itself. Um, this is because they're essentially garbage collected by the JavaScript runtime and not by our runtime. And so we have to manage those separately. And events from the JavaScript and the DOM, we surface as messages to processes in Erlang and Elixir. Uh, so rather than getting like a callback or passing a callback um, to be fired when an event comes in, instead you just get a message like you would for any other event in an Erlang Elixir application. This is very powerful and central, central to the idea of like making working in the browser environment familiar um, and basically work the same as you'd be building an application on the server side. And the FFI point of this is really about that integer limitation, right? That if that's how we have to pass things back and forth, then we need to specially handle translation between Erlang terms and JavaScript values uh, every time we cross that barrier. And that's different than FFI um, in a traditional server environment where um, we can basically pass things directly uh, via the Erl NIF API. And so specifically, why this path and not using the beam, right? So the natural inclination would be, we already have the beam, there's already a ton of engineering effort into that, why don't we make it work for the web rather than rebuild it from the ground up? And there's a couple of factors of why I felt like this path was a more logical route to take than to do that. Uh, it really boils down to these three things, right? So on the runtime side, most of the APIs uh, that the Beam expects to be available are not present in a WebAssembly environment. Virtually everything in the runtime depends on system APIs that just aren't present, even memory allocation APIs. Some of that stuff can be shimmed in or worked around. That's not a huge issue in and of itself. Um, the bigger problem, though, is the scheduler itself would need to be almost completely rewritten for WebAssembly because of those points I brought up earlier, dealing with async functions, uh, managing sort of those special closures. Uh, we actually use, so in Rust, there's futures. It's just been stabilized, actually, in the latest version of Rust. Uh, we have to manage those as like separate resources. And those futures are how we represent JavaScript promises and other like callback-driven events. Uh, that's a completely new type tag in the runtime. Uh, and our ability to even have a separate type tag depends on us not using the tagging scheme that the Beam uses. Uh, a lot of those little changes, they start to accumulate rather quickly, and you find that uh, a lot of the runtime would have to be kind of reworked from the ground up. I also don't know how many of you have ever looked at the BMC code, but it has gotten pretty gnarly over the years. It's hard to untangle. Uh, and then there's these JavaScript managed types. It's just kind of what I was talking about before, where JavaScript values are garbage collected by the JavaScript runtime and not our runtime. So that means anytime we're holding onto a handle to a JavaScript value in Erlang, uh, say an event, right? You get an event comes in, you got that event object that you need to hold on to for a little while while you're working with it. Um, we can't treat that like an Erlang value. We have to treat that as a special resource because it is garbage collected by the JavaScript runtime. The bigger issue really, well, I'm not sure if it's bigger, but it's definitely uh, appropriate for the code size point here. Um, is that the beam bytecode is actually very bulky. Um, every module in your dependency tree uh, has to be included in the runtime app or in the final application with a beam application because it can't do dead code elimination. Um, there's two major reasons for this. One is that it does hot code reloading, which means that at any point it may need to call code that uh, is in that dependency tree that is not called now. And the bigger problem is that you have the, the apply three function, which allows you to call any function completely dynamically at runtime. Um, there's basically no way to see through that. Um, and so with those two problems in place, you can't really strip any code out. 
even when you strip the debug information from the beam files, they're still huge. Like just one of my libraries I maintain, Timex, uh, just the beams of that, not including any of the standard library uh, beam files, is almost a megabyte in size. That's with stripped debug information. When you take into account the entire dependency tree of an application, it's tens of megabytes, which is completely ridiculous on the web, just does not work. You're targeting like less than a megabyte for the complete application, um, ideally. The main reason for this is that it directly impacts load time in your application, um, and anything more than a couple milliseconds starts to impact users directly. And then there's the performance issue of running a virtual machine on top of another virtual machine. Uh, the browsers are pretty smart, actually, in the way that they take WebAssembly modules and JavaScript code in general um, and generate native code from them. But if you're executing beam bytecode on top of a virtual machine, it might be able to reason about the virtual machine code and compile that to native, like using the JIT. But it's not going to be able to reason about the beam bytecode whatsoever. It's completely opaque to it. Um, all it can really see is that central core loop that's executing. It can optimize that, but it can't really do anything about the rest of the code. And that maybe isn't a huge issue, depending on what your application is doing. But let's say you're doing like a, a Raycaster or some other like heavy computational rendering task. Um, any overhead starts to add up real quick. So with a new compiler and runtime, we can work around some of these issues in very specific ways uh, by imposing some restrictions on some of those things I said earlier were problematic. Um, and by choosing an ahead of time compilation strategy versus a just in time virtual machine based uh, system, which is what the Beam is. And then we can also leverage some of the existing ecosystem tools for the web, um, Rust specifically, but more broadly, any libraries that uh, can be invoked via the FFI. So the restrictions that we essentially eliminate are or put in place, rather, are no hot code loading, which means that now we know the full set of all the modules that are going to be in place for the life of that application while it's running. And the second one is that we allow uh, dead code elimination to strip things out that it thinks are dead, even though they might not actually be dead because of the use of that dynamic apply three call. And then we allow users to decorate functions that they don't want stripped with a module attribute to basically say, hey, keep this in here. I know this is going to be alive. Um, hopefully, those things are fairly rare. The other idea that I have that we haven't put in place yet in the compiler is monomorphizing behaviors. So one of the major places where uh, Ply3 is used is actually in OTP and the gen server and some of the other gen behaviors uh, because the module that implements the behavior is opaque to the behavior implementation, so it just invokes that dynamically. Well, if we know that a particular module implements a behavior, then we can monomorphize the implementation of that module with the behavior that it implements. Uh, ideally, that would allow us to eliminate the bulk of the usages of those dynamic calls and do better optimization. And by choosing an ahead of time compilation strategy, we essentially only have to pay then for the things that we're really using at runtime. So that means all the code in the dependency tree that is not actually called, strip it out. Um, we also don't pay for any interpretation overhead. Um, and without a JIT, uh, there's not really anything to counterbalance that. But the argument could be made that uh, with a just-in-time compiler in place, you could actually generate maybe better code than you can ahead of time but that's not really uh, the current state of the beam. That's not really a, an issue that we're worried about. I know there's one coming eventually, uh, but by that point, maybe we'll have a JIT too. Um, more specifically, we're using LLVM for doing code generation, which means that we can take advantage of virtually all the optimization passes it exposes that are applicable to a dynamic language. Um, and there's a surprising number that are actually useful for that. More importantly, we can take advantage of target-specific uh, 
code generation optimizations, um, and LVM is very good about those kind of things. For example, if we happen to know that some recursive loop in the program is working purely with numbers, um, it can lower that down to like a SIMD-based uh, optimized loop. Um, and with MLIR, that's a new framework that's being merged into LLVM, it's even better about doing optimizations like that, like tiling algorithms and such. They're common in like machine learning applications. These are the kind of things that we're interested in um, exposing into Erlang, where one of the traditional sort of limitations is that it's not super great at compu computationally heavy tasks. Um, and we can't completely eliminate that because of the nature of the scheduler, but we can take advantage of those optimizations where they apply. So like I said, we're building on top of LLVM. The implementation of Lumina is also in Rust. Um, and as far as the WebAssembly integration side goes, we're using the Rust WASM toolchain, which is primarily WASM bind gen. What that allows us to do is generate all the bindings to the web APIs uh, at compilation time and map those onto the objects uh, that we're actually using. So that's specifically for the Rust part of it. There's still work that we're having to do to generate bindings for Erlang values. Uh, and that's something that is still on our roadmap. But we get a lot of mileage out of using these tools and not having to reinvent the things that they're good at. These are the main challenges of building a compiler, though, uh, a head time compiler specifically, but one that targets WebAssembly especially. And that's that Erlang is primarily recursive in nature. There's not any sort of looping construct beyond recursive function calls. Um, that means that tail call optimization is absolutely essential to the language. Um, and the runtime, is, the Beam is able to do this because it manages its own stack and everything. It's able to change the instruction pointer however it wants, manipulate the stack. Um, but in a native environment, we're constrained by what sort of features are exposed by the host. And in WebAssembly, a lot of the, the Harvard architecture, that code data split that I mentioned, um, drastically limits our ability to kind of control some of those things. So our solution is therefore also constrained. However, tail call optimization is a feature of LLVM. It's just it, you have to obey very special rules. Um, another thing that the Beam does really well is non-local returns and exceptions. They're very cheap. Um, and some other languages think like Java or C++ are much more expensive. Uh, when you're unrolling a, a big call stack, it's not cheap. Where in the Beam, it is very inexpensive. So you can use throws quite liberally without having to worry about um, imposing a lot of additional overhead. So we want to make sure that we preserve that property as well, since it's commonly used. And then there's the implementation of the preemptive scheduler. It's not actually preemptive. Uh, it's just that the Beam sort of injects cooperative yields uh, for you by maintaining a reduction count internally in the beam that says like, okay, you've done so much work that we think like it's roughly this expensive, we're gonna force you to yield um, at the next you know, useful yield point, like a function call or a blocking, like file read or something like that. There's a couple different places where that kind of thing can happen. Um, and the implementation of green threads is really partially in the scheduler and then partially also and how those cooperative yield points are implemented. When we're doing ahead of time compilation, we have to compile the code with those yield points in place. Uh, we can't rely on the VM to do it for us. WebAssembly is additionally restricted, uh, like I was sort of mentioning there. Uh, one of the main differences from most other environments is it's a stack machine, not a register machine. Um, and so the code that we generate has to take that into account. Luckily, actually, it turns out that LLVM does a lot of this work for us, so it's not quite as bad as I was expecting it to be, but it was one of the major differences. Um, the bigger problem is the requirement on structure control flow. So WebAssembly does not allow you to have like go-to. Um, that's a side effect of having separate code and data address spaces. Uh, you can't have arbitrary jumps to wherever you want. And so that means that your control flow graph has to be constantly 
uh, sort of like statically known in advance or um, able to be mapped to like a jump table. And it can't be to like the middle of a function somewhere, so that eliminates pretty much any useful use of go to. Uh, and that's a common strategy, uh, while set jump and long jump from the C world are commonly used to implement uh, one of the strategies for green threading that I was originally planning to use. Uh, but this restriction eliminates that as a possibility. And likewise, we have no direct access to the stack, so we can't say, uh, you know, call down the stack for so long until we realize that the stack has grown just to the point where it's about to exceed the memory that it has allocated to it, and then unwind the stack to start over again. This would be like a strategy for dealing with tail call optimization. Because we can't access the stack, we can't do that. So we have to pay much more careful attention to how we're structuring function calls to make sure that we obey the rules of TCO and LLVM. All this is imposed on us by WebAssembly. If we were targeting any other architecture, this would be a vastly simpler problem. Uh, unfortunately, we had to do quite a bit of design work to figure out how to work around some of these things. And my solution to this problem ended up being continuations, uh, which sounds sort of counterintuitive with the tail call optimization thing being an issue. Uh, but because LVM obeys special rules for TCO and guarantees it if you follow those rules, continuations actually work. Uh, and so if you're not familiar, continuations basically represent any sort of jump as a call to a continuation. It looks like a function, basically. Uh, because they're all in tail position, this means that uh, if we know that a jump is to a local function or a local branch in the code, um, it can be lowered to that. It doesn't have to be lowered to a function call. And calling to a continuation never returns. Basically, uh, you consider the rest of the execution of the program um, to be rolled up in this function, this continuation that you call. So each step in the program calls another continuation to proceed with the execution of the program. And it's essentially a superset of all possible control flow constructs. So exceptions, green threading, um, functions, they can all be represented this way. To give you a very simple idea, this is a very simple scheduler. So the fork thing here that spawns a new process, yield yields from a process, loop is the body of a process. Imagine like an Erlang process, right? This is the core loop of it. Spawn proc spawns a new process and starts sort of is our little program that we're testing here. So if we look at the spawn proc function, we see that it takes like a string and it returns a function with a counter set to 10 and that message. So the idea here is it's going to loop 10 times and print that message. And what we really want the scheduler to do is interleave the computation so that each process gets an equal amount of time to do its work. So our core loop is doing that. It basically prints a message and then yields, or calls the yield function, with a continuation of the rest of its program. So the rest of its program, from its perspective, is incrementing that counter and starting over. The yield function then queues up that continuation, pops off the last continuation that was queued up, and calls it if it's not nil. If it's nil, then we're done. Scheduler unrolls and it's finished. So when it calls, uh, I'm sorry, back over here in the start function, when we call fork, we're passing it the process that we want to start, that's that spawn proc function that we generate, and the continuation is just going to spawn another process. Again, we're just saying the next step of the program is spawn the B process here. So our program starts by spawning A, and that spawns B, and in the process here of this yielding and looping thing, when we call start, this is what happens. A starts at 10, prints its message, then B gets scheduled, prints its message, and then we go to nine or A and then B again, and all the way back down to zero until we're done. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, it's not super important. It's just trying to give you an idea of like how continuations work. So how's the Lumen compiler structured? 
I broke this down into basically three main categories of interest. Like it's not super important to get real nitty gritty in the details here, but if you're interested, these are the major categories. So our front end uh, currently just accepts Erlang source files. Uh, we have a mixed task for Elixir projects that converts Elixir code into Erlang source code, feeds it to the Lumen compiler. And because we have our own Erlang front end, we did the work to introduce a lot better diagnostics. Um, the Earl C diagnostics are not great. They don't give you a lot of position information or like they can't show you a message that says, hey, these two things are not near each other, but they have the same signature. You know, maybe check them out. I don't know if you've seen like Elm or Rust error messages, but that's basically what we have um, in place over what Earl C provided. So we're able to sort of um, improve some of this the current state of the game as well as uh, build up what already exists in the beam. And then our middle tier basically takes the syntax tree that is produced by the front end and lowers it to um, our intermediate representation, which was uh, essentially Hans uh, Josephson is one of my coworkers who's also working with me on this project. Um, he's the one that's primarily responsible for this middle tier. Um, and he and I came up with a sort of combination of what he had, had in place and what I was eyeballing for Lumen. Um, there's an EIR or an intermediate representation called Thorin that's based on a research paper for a language called Impala. Um, and it's a graph-based IR, sort of a sea of nodes style thing, which means that instead of being a, uh, how do I, say this, instead of being like a SSA or a direct style intermediate representation, the control flow is represented as just edges on a graph. Um, and because of the semantics of Thorin and thus EIR, we're able to represent things as continuation passing style, which is important for our continuation representation. Um, because of this, we're able to do optimizations in this IR Without the disadvantages of CPS, traditionally CPS is uh, not safe to use for some transformations, at least without doing sort of like secondary transformations to keep them safe. Uh, Thorin does not have that downside. Uh, likewise, because of Thorin semantics, it has an easy transformation to SSA or direct style IR, which is perfect for lowering to LVM, which is an SSA IR. So like I mentioned, it's a really great foundation for building our optimizations, and EIR is where we do all of those optimizations. We don't do any at the back end or cogen side um, other than the ones that LVM runs for us. All of our optimizations are written in EIR. And so the back end, the cogen side, does that lowering to LVM IR, um, and then uses the LVM infrastructure to generate object files uh, for WebAssembly or executables for like x86-64 or different platforms. Um, right now, we really have only those two platforms that we do any serious work towards targeting. Um, ultimately, we would like to support like embedded and other platforms as well. Um, and then it also handles doing linking of object files. So one of the things that we are able to do with LVM um, this doesn't exist yet, but I've already done the research for it, is generating object files for like C code or C dependencies that you want to depend on, and then being able to link against those naturally um, instead of having to deal with that yourself. There's still the necessity of passing any like specific compile flags that are required by those dependencies, but that is going to be a reality regardless of what you use. But for some common cases, I think this makes things a lot easier because the C infrastructure can generate uh, WebAssembly code. Um, that works quite well at this point. A lot of my early testing was all using the C compiler uh, targeting WebAssembly. So uh, once we're able to generate object files, we can link against those and call into them quite easily. So where are we at right now with this? Um, essentially, the current state of the game is uh, I am wrapping up the cogen side of it, which has been kind of a major effort for the last couple months. Um, we have an interpreter that Hans wrote uh, that runs in the browser right now, 
but it takes some work to actually like get the code into it to run it. But it's possible to play around with it already uh, using that. And the interpreter basically is in place for us to do testing of, for the runtime, separate from CodeGen. Uh, and so we've used this to make sure that our garbage collection and memory allocation strategy and all that stuff works the way it's supposed to. This is how we tested our uh, type tagging for resources like futures. Uh, so this is in place, and you can play around with it. But uh, if you're interested to wait until things are like really in a serious production ready uh, scenario, you'll want to wait until the CoGen backend gets moved or merged. And there's a couple of PRs that need to get merged before that will be in place. I'm basically looking at two weeks from now to have all that stuff cleaned up. Um, so that'd be a good time to come check out the project. On the roadmap, as far as things that we have already immediately identified or things that we need to work on, um, are getting better type information. So I know there's a couple uh, languages, authors of those languages here. Uh, Lewis uh, working on Gleam, and then there was also PureScript. Uh, both of those languages are tackling the question of like, how do we apply a type system to the Beam, right, or a Beam language? Uh, there, there are some interesting things there, but for us, we really want a type system for Erlang specifically, um, and then be able to leverage that type information when lowering code to LVMIR. There's a lot of optimizations that we can't take advantage of without richer type information. Dialyzer is not really good enough for that sort of thing. Um, it's good for checking your program, but it's not good for generating type metadata that we can rely on when doing optimizations. We have to know for sure that a value is of a particular type, otherwise we can't generate the optimized code for it. Um, or we can generate it and then have like a de-optimization thing that happens, but it's not really worth the effort to do that unless we have the types in the first place. The other step is generating the uh, JavaScript and the DOM bindings automatically. Uh, what uh, Luke, my other coworker, who's been working on the runtime side, has had to do is essentially hand write the bindings for the Erlang APIs that he's calling. Um, we already know how we need to do the auto generation in part because we've seen how that's done in Rust, but we have not built that yet. And the last step is uh, doing in-browser debugging. So this is like source maps and actually stepping through code in the browser debugger. This like kind of works, uh, but there's a lot of missing pieces in the browser itself. There are proposals in place and things happening on the LVM side as well to make this happen. Um, essentially the way like debug info is represented in the browsers is separate from how it's traditionally represented um, on other architectures. So because of some of those ongoing efforts, uh, we're only able to take advantage of part of that. And finally, is just supporting a wider array of targets. So this, one of the targets I want to support is ARH64 for like uh, embedded devices, iPhones, stuff like that. Um, that's another target that we could add support for. And I guess that's about it. Um, I don't know how much time we got or not, but. About me, minus two minutes. All right. <laughs> so I, I don't think we have time for questions, but you can catch Paul out of the break. <laughs>